Welcome back to the Flat Earth Podcast. I'm your co-host, Curious Jay, alongside me, Dave, from deep inside the rabbit hole. Once again, finally back for another dose of Flat Earth Audio. And first and foremost, got to apologize for the delay. It's been a few weeks since we've been on, uh, mostly due to schedule conflicts. I'll say that. There was quite a few times where Dave could record, but I couldn't. And then uh, even a couple times vice versa. But this particular episode, we're running into technological issues like crazy. It's insane. The amount of technical, if I had a tinfoil hat, I would be suspicious that uh, somebody was purposely uh, messing with us, maybe demonic forces at this point. Yeah, I don't actually officially own a tinfoil hat, but I am suspicious. <laughs> Either way, yeah. Um, wow, it took us, I mean, it took us 10, 15 minutes just to get up and running to get it to record. <laughs> which is not normal, plus the, uh, the technical difficulties we had with our interview. We'll talk about that in moments to come. But, all right, a lot going on. Sorry it's been so long since we haven't been on, but that means we're going to get a really long episode today, right, Dave? I would think so. <laughs> yeah. First off, let's talk about some of the Flat Earth drama. We don't normally get into that, but I think it's important that we address it. There was some attacks made uh, just in the last couple of days, actually, about some of the regular flat earth posters. Dave, you want to touch on that? Because when we talked before we started recording, you had some good points to bring up. Yeah. You know, there's there's so much drama going on right now. And, and basically, I take a step back and look at it this way. Um, whether you believe in a circle map, a triangle map, uh, a Pac-Man map or any other map, it doesn't matter. Um, it would be nice knowing the true makeup of our world. But one thing we all have in common is that we know we don't live in a godless heliocentric spinning ball. And with that, with that in mind, um, that's really what matters. And we're trying to figure out the rest. So we, we're not, yeah. you know, people say you don't have a working flat earth model. Um, yeah, but you, you, you have a proven unworking ball model. So, there, there's, uh, there's been a couple of attack videos. Uh, do you want to get into it, Jay? <laughs> for those of you who haven't heard, there was some um, uh, attack videos levied against Mark Sargent for being uh, someone other than who he says he is. And, you know, it's one thing to come up with gut feelings. Because I've, I've read this a lot, and, and um, I'd, I'd be lying if, if I didn't say when I first got into the flat earth, if I didn't get suspicious at, at, at certain times over certain people, because one, for one thing, it's put out there so much. I mean, I never heard the word shill until I got into the flat earth, but once I did get into the flat earth, I was hearing it levied left and right, you know, every which way, uh, from Eric Dubay to Mark Sargent. I mean, just this guy's a shill, that guy's a shill right now. The charges filed, or I guess the the points brought forward, were the facts that you know Mark claims that he discovered or realized the Earth was flat back in 2014. And then he put out his clues, but um, another channel came along and said, "Well, wait a second. We found out that MarkSargent.com was registered back in 2010." You know, I I just can't put a lot of weight into that. 2010 or 2012, charge. but a couple of years yep. before. Right, right. Maybe it was 2012. Maybe I mis, uh, misremembered that. But point being, yeah, the charge was is that he came out with the website or, or he bought the do domain, you know, a good two years prior to putting out the clues. And I got to say, you know, if it if this was a, a court of law, we'd have to just. I think I think the the video was alleging that the guy that built the website bought the domain uh, several years before Mark realized that the Earth was flat, um, according to his own testimony. Um, but I think that the, what happened was, and, and I think there's evidence, uh, of, of this, that the domain ha had been bought and expired numerous times in 2012, it was bought by huge domains.com. And when Mark in 2015 said, this guy approached him and said, Hey, let's do a website and make an app and this whole thing. And Mark's like, yeah. And what, what, uh, what webs, what, uh, address do you want? And he's let's see if Mark Sargent's available. And lo and behold, he was able to get. Mark Sargent and the guy registered it, bought it from hugedomains.com. Maybe I have the name wrong, but I believe that's what it was. And uh, that's a pretty damn good explanation. Um, so the whole premise of the video is kind of destroyed right from the beginning. Yeah, I, that's that's what I wanted to say is that, 
if if researching it, if if they stumbled across the information that back in 2012, um, the domain Mark Sargent Flat Earth Clues, if that was bought, we'd be talking about something different right now. For sure. You know, that For that sure. would actually uh, indicate, yeah, there's a discrepancy. However, tons of people, myself, yourself, have bought their name as a domain in the past. So I guess the easy defense of this, if I was, if I was as a def- well, as the, defense, the, the argument just- is that this guy that's doing business with them bought it uh, in several years before, you know, so knowing that he's going to do business with them, but that's not what happened. Right. Right. And, and I guess my point would be is, is it's just a name that was bought. It wasn't, it had nothing to do with flat earth. Jay, here's the problem I have with uh, with a video like that. One, it serves no purpose other than to divide the community. But if it's something that you really feel strong about and you want to put out there, just like a real reporter back in the days when there were real reporters, you should go to the source and say, hey, um, I've got a big problem uh, this is the video I'm putting out. Would you like to uh, give me your side of the story before I tell a one-sided story? Yeah, yeah. And and to my knowledge, I, I don't know if anyone has reached out uh, to Mark. I, I think Mark has made himself pretty open to the uh, to the public thus far. He puts his email and his phone number out there. Anybody can call him and ask him. He uh, you know he does his radio show. Anybody can call in. There's no problem getting through. Um, and ask him any question you want. You know, when I've seen these attack videos on him and Patricia Steer, um, you know, there was some hit videos out on her uh, from a couple of years ago. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. I wonder what the, you know, that's very suspicious. Rather than make a hit video, not that I would, um, I called her and I talked to her and she showed, explained and showed to me exactly how these videos were wrong. And I'm telling you, it they're wrong. Um, I don't agree with everything Mark Sargent does. Uh, you know, the way he explains the earth, hey, it's a Truman show and closed disc that, you know, that it, that drives me a little crazy. But you know what? I don't know. If you ask me, I think we are in some sort of enclosed world. Um, I can't prove it. Uh, you know, Mark, Mark made, uh, makes a comment about, you know, um, the heat coming from underneath. Well, maybe the heat. You know, maybe the sun, the electrical sun and moon are interacting with something electrical underneath the earth. And and that is where the heat is coming from, because it does get awfully hot down there as we dig. Um, I don't know the answer and neither neither does anybody. And uh, during this flat earth awakening, you know, people have changed their opinions on on many things, you know, and I've changed my opinion. Um, Switching over to another little more drama. There's another uh, person I don't know, you know, who is uh, is fantastic at debunking the debunkers and he really tears them apart. But now he's attacking everybody that believes in the circle map, including myself, including Jaron, including ODD. saying that we're ignoring evidence and uh, we're going to be exposed and we're shills um, because we think that there is some sort of circle map uh, resembling the AE map. Um, but yet this person has has yet to explain what it is that debunks it. I'm all for it. I, uh, I offered, I, I was like, show me what you got. Can't wait to see it. Maybe it's going to teach me something new. And the only response I got was being deleted and uh, the comment deleted and being blocked on Facebook. You know, I'll say this in, in um, not defense, but on the other side of the coin, I'll say this. I do understand where skepticism comes in as far as our community goes. Is I, I get it. You know what I mean? I mean, we're all convinced that we're being lied to on a daily basis for the last several hundred years. <laughs> I get it. We also know that the way, you know, the uh, alphabet organizations of the government work that, yeah, they like to infiltrate and, and control the narrative. So I, I, I do understand people looking hard into people and saying, Oh, this guy raised, I, I get it. Okay. But I do think that if we're going to throw a video out there that just, you know, completely, throw someone in the bus. I think we should come with something better than, but you, you know, putting a video out there serve no purpose other than to divide the community. It's divide and conquer um, is how they take down movements like this. And, and, you know, when you say the, the, the letter agencies, you know, they, they will infiltrate. I don't even think those infiltrators are here yet, except, you know, maybe one or two um, that are, are consciously, 
uh, set up as infiltrators. I think this is more of a, a spiritual um, infiltration where, you know, the, you know, the, the elite, I don't believe they run the world. I believe the, the entities that they pray to, that they have given their souls to um, are controlling them and they're and and controlling the world they the the elite keep us in a low vibration of fear with all of their fake events all of their horrifying news you know all of their programming and because when you're in a low vibration these low vibrating evil entities for lack of a better uh explanation have can vibrate with you and infiltrate you and steer you um into taking your eyes off the ball. Right. We all agree that we live, we don't live on a godless heliocentric ball. And, you know, if you, if you get people uh, poking at each other, it's like that episode of the twilight zone where the, the, an alien, they, they thought they saw an alien, uh, you know, land and, and all the townspeople started suspecting each other. You did it, you did it, you did it. And they destroyed the entire town. They all, you know, destroyed themselves by the alien stood up on the hill and watched. Yeah. The alien didn't have to lay a finger on them. You didn't have to lay a finger. And that's what they want to do. Divide and conquer. They can't do anything to us. They can only help us do it to ourselves. Yeah. You know, the, these these uh, hit videos, these accusations of people, if you don't like what someone does, ignore them. Right. Just, just say, I don't agree with that person. This is what I believe. And put your information out there because the light always overtakes the darkness. You know, the truth will will shine bright over the lies. And if you can raise your consciousness, your vibration, the vibratory level um, th- those evil, low vibrating spirits cannot affect you. So I'll ask you this, Dave, and I didn't ask you this before we went on the air. So let me ask you this. Um, let's say you're researching and you do stumble across something about someone in the truth community or the uh, flat earth world. And you think it's pretty, you know, in your eyes, let's say you think it's damning. What 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 does uh, Dave from Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole do next? You, you know, I, I think you I think you brought up a good point earlier when you said reach out to the person. I think that's a great idea. But what would you do? Would you maybe even before reaching out, I would go to a, a couple of other um, you know people that that are prominent in the in the research and say, hey, I found this out. What do you guys think of this? Can you see it in a different light than I'm seeing it? And and reach out, and then maybe a couple of us get together and say, this is really disturbing. This is really bothering me. Let's do a private call with this person. Ask them to please explain this because we have a problem with it. And then if it turns out that we were right or I was right or whatever, um, then we just say, you know, hey, we, we, we don't want to associate with you anymore. We, you know, maybe we even put out a, a small piece of information saying due to uh, some disagreements between us, we're no longer associating with XYZ company. It, it's literally like a competitor. You just ignore them and do your thing better. By talking about this, we're talking about this because it is actually – uh, flat earth news, if you will, but I, I don't think either of us have it in our intentions to, to, to stir it up. You know what I mean? He, to- he, here, here's the thing. I hate this drama. And when people point this stuff out to me, I have no idea what's going on. People talk to me like, Oh, did you see the so-and-so video? I'm like, who is so-and-so they're at another vibrational level where I don't see them. Right. Because, the, cause I'm not interested in that stuff. You know, people putting out videos, just disparaging other people, you know, like in a relationship, one of the spouses says, Oh, this person, you know, always, does this and in fact they're the ones that do it this is what's going on you know talk about you know if, if you think that mark and patricia who we're, we're naming out here because everybody knows at this point are shills ask yourself what have they done to divide the flat earth community because every time i ask somebody how did you learn about flat earth uh nine out of ten times they say mark Sargent's clues okay so if Mark is a shill, um, whoever got him, I'd like to order seven more, please. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it makes absolutely no sense. But if he is, he's horrible at it. And it doesn't matter because if you don't like him, then that's fine. That's your choice. You know, I don't see Mark doing hit pieces on anyone else or any, or anything like that, nor, nor Patricia, um, that, that's it. I don't want to make this about them, but it's about 
dividing and conquering. If you look at, if you look at it, you know, the, the, someone says, you know, my wife does this or my husband does this, you know, and they're the ones that actually do it. Think about what's going on here. You know, what is causing harm to this big rock community? You know, unfortunately it's a rock, not a pizza. Um, it's being divided into rubble. It's being divided into rubble. I don't think that it can be destroyed, but this is not helping anything um, by, by doing attack videos, attack videos are actually creating exactly what they're complaining about. Look, I'll say this, whether it gets to our vibration or not, if, if someone has something concrete on someone, is it worth the rest of us knowing? Possibly so. Sure. But you know, I, I, I think you just said it best earlier when you said, man, get in touch with the person, ask them, ask them their side of it. And I, I'm not sure that I, that any of the videos that have come out on this subject have done that. I, I, it certainly doesn't appear to, you know, I, I've asked, you know, a lot of people are, are, are messaging me and asking me and I'm like, have you, I go, why don't you call them? I go, you know, they're reachable. Why don't you ask them yourself? Because I've already gotten the answers. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things. There's certain flat earthers. There's people all through my life, you know, through, through my entire being that I, I don't like. I don't like what they do. I don't make hit videos about them. I vibrate them right out of my life. There's certain flat earthers. I don't like what they do. I've unsubbed them. I never see their videos. And the only time I hear about it is when somebody else that's vibrating low enough to see their stuff uh, sends it my way. And I usually just don't even look. But sometimes, you know, it's coming from somebody I trust and, and, and what not. Um, and I'll look and, and, and there it is. The problem yeah. is we are all, every single one of us, the ones that are making it, well, I, you know, I don't know who MGTV is or, or whatever. Um, but we're on the, we're on the same page. We don't live on a godless heliocentric ball. Yeah. One of the flat earthers that, uh, that I respect said, do you really think that the, that the, it'll change the world, the flat earth way awakening? And I don't believe that he does, but in fact, I think it will absolutely change the world because it changed the world for me. Once I realized, you know, I was a, a godless heliocentric evolution, uh, dinosaur believing, you know, evolved from monkeys guy. And, uh, and that's it. We were an insignificant speck in the universe. I discovered the flat earth and quickly I realized we live in an intelligently designed place. Um, I was a pretty nice guy before, but I think I'm even nicer now. And I, and I, uh, I have lost all my fear um, of, of anything. And that changes the world. I have vibrated myself away from these satanic forces that that are really trying to rule this world and if everyone woke up tomorrow morning they would be done it's a game changer and the heliocentric lie is the biggest most important deception for them because it keeps us in an insignificant flying through an infinite universe speck of godless dust a uh, state of being on a spinning ball where we don't know where our feet are um, and that is their most important lie I think that they are scrambling right now. They are trying to they're trying to get us off kilter, get get to get as many people as they can into a low vibration, influence them to start making divisive moves and divide us and conquer from within. Um if they don't do this, they can completely lose control over um over the world and and it's that simple you know people there, there's many people that say you know if flat earth uh, you know flat earth goes mainstream it's not going to change anything it's going to change everything what do you think about that jay no i think it's well said and that's why i wanted to sit back you 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 and i talked about this before we went on the air and we were asking ourselves if we should even talk about this and we thought we should because it's like i say it's in the news and you just went off and so I, I was hoping I was hoping you would. I think that's I think you're right. It's well it's well said, man. Um, and, and me talking about you know demons or satanic forces uh, controlling us. It's absolutely truth. I mean, you can have a good day where you're inspired by the Holy Spirit above, whatever name you want to put on that, and you're having this high vibration day. It happens, and then you have a bad moment or something, and that's when you allow yourself to come down to a lower vibration. And there's people right. that stay in this low vibration, um, but they get satisfaction from it you know there you, we've seen the bob dylan thing where he said he sold his soul to the devil and now he's paying you know he doesn't look too happy about it but mm -hmm. was it dylan that said that um yeah, yeah i think yeah, it was yeah 
but you know, then we have you know the, the regular trolls that you know troll the flat Earth community. Um, you know, most of them are just basement dwellers that have uh, you know whatever deal consciously or subconsciously they made. You know, maybe to make themselves feel important. You know, to get out and talk to people. Whatever, whatever it is, it may be insignificant to us and very significant to them. But these forces, these spirits, are what um, can, you know control us we you know sometimes people say i was just inspired what were you inspired by was it a positive inspiration or a negative inspiration and there's a lot of this uh low uh fear-based inspiration i'll call it or or uh coercion um that is that is driving people to do a lot of stupid things <laughs> look i'm not gonna sit up here on a pose and and uh lecture anyone about this because I, I even admit it to you. I said, I've, I've had suspicions on certain people before, but I said, you know what? You're right. It's probably the, uh, the those little demons floating around buzzing at me. And I, I, I fell, fell victim to it before, but you're right. If we could all just keep a, a higher vibration and like, uh, like David Icke says, you know, get, get to a point where we're so high that they can't touch us. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, and a lot of people think that David Icke is just a shill or, or whatever. <laughs> right. I, I don't believe, I think he believes everything he's saying. I think he's right about a lot of stuff. And I think some other stuff is, I'll just say, I have no friggin' idea what's going on. But he said, someone asked him, um, I think it was even Sophia Smallstorm, um, that asked him if, is he afraid of uh, the elite? you know, um, getting to him with all of the stuff that he's saying. And his answer was not at all that he vibrates at a completely different level than these low vibration beings. And they can't even see him, let alone touch him. So and let's, those are some powerful try. words right there. Very much so. And, and um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's try to do that. And on that note, we'll put <laughs> the drama down and yeah. uh, pick up some more topics, uh, you know, quickly on a non flat earth, but certainly a very truth oriented topic. We haven't even been on, like I said, in, in three, three and a half weeks. Has it been um, that long? Yeah. It's been like three, it's been at least three weeks since we, we put out our episode with Luke uh, from the English podcast, which by the way, we got tons of really, really great feedback on that. I thought it was a great episode. Even, even Luke wrote up a story on his blog about it. And, um, had the same amount of respect that that uh, for it, us that that we do for him. Yeah, think about that. You know, this guy is adamantly against flat Earth, and we got along <laughs> super well. I yeah. consider him a friend. We're gonna have a beer if we, if he comes here, or I go there. <laughs> That's I I couldn't agree more. And you know, I'd love to. I, I think we did raise, and he even mentioned it. Um, I, I believe in his story that he wrote on it, we did mention enough topics that. Did, got him thinking about uh, some things. And so I'd love to touch base with him in a couple months and see if he's looked into it at all. But yeah, so it's been about that long. And the point I was trying to make, Dave, is, is a lot's happened, you know, to the flat earth, not necessarily in flat earth, but to the flat earth since we were last on uh, the Vegas stuff, the fires, you know, I don't want to go too far off wow. the flat, flat topic, <laughs> but I think it needs addressing a little bit here. Well, we you can know, talk about the fires. The, the fires were flattened, you know, yeah, <laughs> right, right across yeah. the flat earth there. Um, just touching real quick on the fires, you know, there's a boom. Div, div, here comes all the divisiveness again. When somebody says directed energy, that goes back to the Dr. Judy Wood thing. Um, and, and there's so many people that absolutely hate her. Um, I don't, I'm not relating this to Dr. Judy Wood. And I don't even like calling it directed energy um, because – I guess you can call it directed energy. The, these it's fires, something. these fires are not normal. There's swaths of houses that are gone that have woods on both, you know, uh, behind the houses uh, on opposite sides of the street, and and trees intermix, and none of the leaves are gone on these trees, and these houses are white ash to the bottom, white ash yeah. to the, you know, and that is not. What happens? I have a, a friend who is a fire chief, uh, showed him the pictures and some of the videos. And he's, he's like, Oh, that could happen. That could happen. No, that's impossible there. You know, he goes that he goes, what? He goes, these pictures can't be real. You, you know? Uh, yeah. That drone footage above, uh, some of those areas in California where yeah. literally, um, you've got blocks of, of a neighborhood area where everything is 
just incinerated down to the ground. I don't even know if incinerated is a strong enough word because it literally has just uh, dustified, to quote Judy, uh, it dustified everything. And yet it's green as can be in between the houses, meaning the grass, the, the trees, the leaves on the tree didn't even burn or fall off. That my, to me was amazing. My fire chief friend said that when a house burns, even trees that are like 20, 30, 50 yards away, you know, they just go poof. The leaves, you know, all come off the tree, you know, and, yeah. and there's people out there, you know, uh, flat earthers even that's like, well, this is not true. You know, the tree is alive, you know, in the center of the tree could be dead and that's how it burns from the inside. And, uh, you know, that, that there is truth to that, but there would, it, they would be scorched. The leaves would not stay on. You know, the granite countertops wouldn't be missing. Cars wouldn't be dissolved the way they were dissolved. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. There's just that was the that was the kicker for me was seeing all of that green in between those um, uh, those those houses. And then there was a couple of, of pieces of drone footage above some little sh strip malls and shopping areas like an Applebee's and that sort of thing where. You know, hey, it was like, how did the fire one, get there? That was Arby's, and they paid a lot of money for that product placement. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one I saw had Arby's and an, an Applebee's. Showed. I only um, saw the just, Arby's, so And sorry. I just remembered making a joke about uh, Applebee's um, after seeing that, probably in poor taste, but <laughs> yeah, too soon. But, um, yeah, it, it was just they were in the middle of, like, a, a shopping area. And, again, once again, trees. Uh, nothing else was damaged. How did the fire even get in there? It's amazing that the destruction of these homes and the evacuations are exactly line up with the Agenda 21 uh, depopulation or, or, or uh, urban renewal areas. It, it, it lines up perfectly. Same map. These fires happened. Uh, in the areas that they want people to move out and move into highly condensed cities. And all of the land is being bought up by FEMA um, and... Uh, other other um, government agencies uh, for pennies. Oh, so what about Vegas? What's your take on Vegas? Do I need to even ask? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I did an interview with uh, Sophia Smallstorm, Sage of Quay, yep. Mike Williams, and uh, uh, Alex Scott, a police officer. Um, where you can find this video, we'll link it in the on the Facebook page, but you can find it at Sage of Quay. Uh, YouTube channel or Sage of Quay blog. What is it? What is his, his uh, YouTube? Um, just say, look up Sage of Quay. Um, you'll find it on, on YouTube. Yeah. So, yeah. I listened to it today. It was my, really good. Uh, my take on it is uh, I made a t-shirt. It's called nobody died in Vegas. <laughs> what size do you want? Jay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a horrible t-shirt. It's a wonderful t-shirt. You'll take a large nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, until I listened to your the the show that you were just talking about, until I listened to that discussion, I've been kind of up in the air where I'm not sure, like, you know, I was kind of in the middle recently in the last couple of weeks. I was in the middle as far as the multi-shooter thing or is it total farce is it a total crisis actor thing all i was certain on is that it is definitely not as sold as the official story tells us um we would have seen the footage by now of this guy entering the the hotel going up you know to his room that sort of thing um and we still have yet to see any of that it's almost like the pentagon footage it's like it doesn't even exist and yet we're in a building that we know is like the Pentagon, one of the most surveilled areas in the world. Vegas is so, so covered when it comes to uh, the closed circuit cameras. But yeah, I, I was listening to you guys and I was a little more sold to uh, the fact I was listening to you talk about the fact that it was probably all BS and yeah, I'm leaning that way now. So I don't want to say that I actually made this thing I'm about to say happen, but um, in this time uh, that we are in, uh, which I'll call the quickening, um, things seem to be manifesting a lot faster. You know, when you think of something and boom, there it is. You've noticed that that's been happening faster and faster. Yes. And when you're in a high yes. vibration, uh, it happens faster and faster. I think actually when you're in a low vibration, shitty things happen faster and faster yeah. uh, too. So you have to be careful what you think because your thoughts create your reality. And I was thinking, you know what? One of these hoaxes is going to get busted by a drone 
or a P900. Someone's going to see it going on and zoom in and get it, right? Yeah. You know, because of all these P900s out there. Well, uh, a video was l- released. I think it was on Maddie D's channel, Maddie D for Truth, or, or don't quote me on that. I'll, I'll put a link um, somewhere um, where a guy filmed in the, the days following with a P900, the FBI walking around the site, you know, doing the cleanup and the, the supposed investigation. Um, he's showing all of the the tents and the signs and the ground and the pavement and the posts and the um, banners uh, zooming in on them super close rooftops, no bullet holes anywhere. Wow. They should be peppered. You know, and my, I actually left a response in the video. I was like, Are you, don't be silly. He would never hit the bullet. You know, he was very accurate. He could hit a guy in the chest. And while he's spinning away, falling to the ground, he could hit him two more times within inches. This guy is very accurate. He wouldn't hit another object. And that didn't go over so well. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gets sarcasm in, a, in, a, in the damn uh, – Comment threads. Yeah. But it, I just thought it was, it's an hour video. Uh, he did four 15 minute segments. Um, zooming in, just crawling over, you know, uh, all of the area. And you would see holes in all of those tents. True. Yeah. There's none. Well, um, there's definitely, uh, after listening to you guys talk today, I was definitely leaning more towards the, um, the side of, of just that it's all. You know, one theory I did here a couple weeks ago, um, and go with me on this, was that, what's his name, Paddock, was Paddock. was a gun dealer, and that- Great story. Yeah, and that some of the guys- <laughs> Yeah, when ISIS got involved, and it, it, it's, it's utter nonsense, because again, uh, Las Vegas, the CCTV capital of the world, has no video of this guy anywhere. You know, the, the, the hotel- the the elevators to the to to the towers are in the middle of the casino. Wait, you know, what the casinos? There's no space in there where you're not on five video cameras at any time. Wow, you know, in, in the place where they catch you counting cards, they don't catch you setting up a friggin' command post with cameras in the hallway and you know doing stuff. The guy took out the windows. Uh, um, where th- these windows have sensors on them, and if you bang up against the window, security will be up in your room in seconds. You know, within a minute or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's so much about the Vegas know, thing. Just there, there's so many people that fell for the live leak video where where the guy is running around filming in portrait from person to person. You, you okay, bro? Oh, you I know, saw that. And, I and, didn't fall you know, for that. Slap that was horrible. But there's people that like, well, you know, the girl with the blood coming out of her mouth. She was. She looked real. And my question is, you know, what do you think? They have a bunch of crisis actors and stick a dead person in the middle. Um, <laughs> It doesn't work. Well, somebody took the video that, you know, the the 10 seconds they were on her or five seconds and did it frame by frame. And her eyes opened and closed at one point, like for two frames, her eyes closed oh. and then they went back open again. So. So it was obviously it's, cut together. No, it's no, it's beyond. She blanked. She, oh, did, she was playing oh, dead. The dead she one. was playing dead. The one that was dead with her eyes open and bleeding out of her mouth. Uh, but she blanked. Well, Dave, there's, you know, lots of things that happen after we, you know, we, we pass on. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> it, it, when you touch someone on the neck when they're dead, their eyes blink. Right. Don't you know that? You you, you flat tard. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. So speaking of flat tards and um, going back to the flat earth topic, we got an email that I wanted to read because both of us went, hmm. Yep. Let me find the name of the sender really quick. But it has to do with a curvature test. All right. And this yep. comes from, we'll just call him LBB. And uh, he says, you know, I love I love what you guys do. Could this be the final simple boats over the horizon test to debunk the globe? And what he proposes, and we're going to post a um, the visual diagram that he sent us. We'll post that on the Flat Earth Podcast Facebook page so that you can get a look at this. But essentially, imagine for a second... Uh, I guess the way I explained it to you earlier, Dave, when we were talking about it was imagine a black cube, but the bottom of the cube is neon green. I'm using the colors in his diagram. If you sent that black cube, let's say that's uh, uh, part of a ship. So the cube is all black, yes. except the bottom is neon yes. green. Yes, a cube has six sides, yeah. right? 
Uh, the top and all four sides going around are black, but the bottom is neon green. And we send that thing uh, out over the ocean, over the water, and we watch it disappear over the horizon. Okay. Now, his point is, is if that disappearance over the horizon is due to the curvature of the earth, then that cube would what? It would start curving over the earth and you would be able to see with your P900 the green bottom as it went over. So, you know, obviously you, we can't create a large black cube and send it out uh, over the ocean, but you know, this is a good concept to look at as far as, you know, he says in his idea, he would say he would take a boat, a P900 and then get a tall color coded, jagged edged curvature tower. So create the tower, a tower on the shore with something, you know, with something with black, uh, black posts on the tower, but make one, make the bottom side of those different posts at different levels, make those colored and then take off in the boat. Now you mentioned the fact the boat might be bobbing up and down, that sort of thing. So it needs to be fine tuned, but I think that uh, LBB brought up a really, really good concept as far as curvature tests that I don't think anyone has, has tried doing. Yeah. I mean, you could do it, you know, at the same place that Jaron is doing his laser test, um, you know, where you can set something up, let's set it up at six feet or 10 feet. doesn't really matter the height because it doesn't have to go over the curve. And uh, so you have the bottom of this thing at six feet and then you go three miles, six miles, 10 miles away, have your camera leveled on the water at six feet and look at it and you should be able to see green. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're, we'll post the diagram on the Facebook page, as we mentioned, but definitely you guys, it's worth taking a look at because I think with some fine tuning, this could be a really solid test, um, much like the one that Jaron from Jaronism is planning very soon. Oh, that reminds me, you wanted to mention your, your glass test for the horizon. Oh, yeah. No. So a lot of people, when uh, you know they say the horizon rises to your eye level, I think it doesn't really rise to your eye's level, but you can't tell the difference because the difference is less than a millimeter. Um, and that millimeter could be 10,000 feet at, uh, at any distance. But lots of times when you look out at the horizon, it's in different places due to the thickness of the atmosphere. So when it when the atmosphere is a little thicker with particulates, um, it may become opaque. Which when it's opaque, it's literally sky. It becomes sky. So that horizon, the the actual horizon, would be behind some sky. So where you're seeing the sky meet the water is actually in front of where um, the real horizon would be. The, the real horizon, which is the limit of your eyesight is. So you're actually not seeing as far. So all you need to do is get a glass of water and hold it in front of your face and look, lower it, you know, raise it to your eye level, just so your eye is skimming across the top of the water and then look into the distance. And wherever that line is in the distance, that is where the horizon truly is. Um, it, whether you can see it or not, that's where it is. Good point. I, it took me, when you mentioned that about a month or two ago to me, it took me a little while to get my head around it. But yeah, I totally understand that now. And I think it, I think it would work. Sometimes when I'm uh, looking down uh, the water here, trying to, to spot land um, farther away, I'm like, where I'm trying to look for it and I'll hold the glass in front of me. I'm like, Oh man, the horizon is way higher than I'm looking and I'll look and I'll see it, you know, or I'll realize, oh, it's just too thick today. I'm never going to see it. And then other days, um, I can see much farther. But the water will always tell you uh, where that true horizon is. It's a good point. You want to open up a couple speak pipes real quick? Yeah, fire one up. All right. So this one is from Andrew. Hey, guys. Um, Andrew from Alberta, Canada. Um love your podcast uh, really informative um it's really interesting i uh, just had a quick question about the um the earth curve math um for the curvature the whole eight inches per square uh, per mile squared um heard it a lot seen it in a lot of other videos and a lot of other content um just ran into another video from um from a youtuber his youtube uh name is h i i t h uh, if you want to look into it or not um, but he claims that that whole math doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And he has another formula that 
apparently it's way more complicated looks pretty accurate but just wondering if you guys wanted to take a look into that and maybe compare the two um and see um see what your response would be to something like that uh thanks again uh look forward for uh, look forward to hearing your next podcast thanks thanks andrew for the speak pipe and this was the one that we actually did pre-listen to i'm going to play some more in a second dave that we haven't listened to but we did listen to it and we did check out the video and you, you know you're right i'll say this i've never heard of that formula before and we did it maybe what 30 minutes ago like right before we started recording so neither one of us have taken the time to dive into that formula but i've, I've never actually heard of that. taken i've actually taken steps to resolve this there you go um so i never heard of that formula um it's a little above my uh understanding uh, in the minutes that we looked at it i have to really study it a little more um but it's interesting that it's new there's also this is a young kid he's pretty well spoken uh, i'm just wondering you know um maybe he's just super smart and and he he absolutely absolutely believes it but what I have done while we were talking here, I have sent this video to Jaron <laughs> to uh, analyze. And if he doesn't analyze it, uh, then he is a shill and we all must uh, make hate videos about it. OK, him. well, because, yeah, I'm not I, I'm not going to call him on it either. I'm just going <laughs> to jump to the conclusion. Just make a video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like we sent him this thing and he did not take care of it. And therefore, he's a global shill. Oh, you know it. You know it. Right. I knew it. I'm sorry for making a joke. I'm sorry for making a joke, but you know, sometimes those demons get to me right. also. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess what we'll, the reason we wanted to play that was so that everyone out there could also go check out that video. Um, yeah. The guy's well-spoken, seems to be pretty intelligent. I will say he's a little condescending in the video, um, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm definitely going to take the math and, and analyze it in, uh, in, in the days and weeks to come because you know that's what we do, and and we'd be, um, we we'd be what we accuse the globe siders of if we didn't dive into it. So um, yeah, hopefully Jaron's looking into it as well. Well, Jaron has done so much with you know really looking at the curvature formula and it's like why does this not make sense and this does make sense and um, I think that he uh, might have a little more insight than us re re recreating the wheel. Yes, yes. All right, cool. So let's check out another speak pipe before my phone battery goes dead let's try this one uh this is from travis finley hey guys travis finley from the plain truth rethinking the curve here i uh i posted on my facebook group rethinking the curve uh, a question about the horizon rising to the eye level as altitude <laughs> increases and i had a phd mathematician friend respond saying this isn't true from the top of Mount Baldy in Southern California at 10,000 feet above sea level, the horizon, looking southward, is below level. The higher you climb, the lower the angle to the horizon. And then he gave his equation that uh, he supposedly did his little report on and got an A+. Plus. So I um, was just wondering if maybe you guys could talk about that a little bit. Thanks. Well... In fact, I think we just did. I think I think we did. My uh, my take on it is that how do you know you're seeing the horizon? You know, from that height, it's in California. He said, yeah, Mount you know, the how clear is the air there? Um, it it turned the sky. The the it you can't see through uh, a certain amount of opaqueness, and it just becomes sky. And the horizon, the, the visible what you think is the horizon drops lower and lower. I can see the horizon lower than eye level on a semi clear, you know, semi cloudy or foggy day because the sky turns to horizon before, um, you know, before the angle of resolution becomes too small in the distance. Got you. That's my take on it right there, you know, and, and then you can make a formula that, Hey, that pretty much follows the curve of the earth. But if the, if the curve of the earth was true, none of these things would ever change. Like when you look at a building and the bottom eighth is missing and then another day, the bottom quarter is missing another day, half is missing, you know, another day you can see the beach in front of it. That's not curvature. That's yeah. That's optical atmospheric block. I was about to say, yeah, that's, that's a, um, other factors in the atmosphere, the water, land, um, uh, 
temperature has an effect on all that. That's so many other factors to say that simply it's just the curve of the earth. Yeah, you're right. It would be something way more consistent that we would see. And in fact, we don't see that. Correct. All right, let's go one more, Dave, from uh, Dave Hinkle. Hi, Dave. I'm curious, Joe. This guy, John McIntyre, thinks he's found some curvature again. Check out his channel. It says water, water test number two, I think. Want to hear you all respond to it. Peace. Okay, so we haven't, uh, again, we're listening to these live. Um, we'll have to check that out. You remember John McIntyre from about six episodes ago that did the uh, test. The guy sent in a, um, a speak pipe for us, and he said, go check it out. He was the guy who set up the triangles in his driveway and uh, as mock right. mountain peaks. You right. remember that? So apparently he's done another one called water test number two and thinks he's found some curvature. So uh, we will definitely take a look at that, Dave. Thank you for sending that in and uh, encourage everyone else to do so as well. Another one of those John McIntyre videos. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have more on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sending it, and we will take a look at it for sure. So, um, also want to make a real quick announcement. We've done this in the past, but I think we forgot the last few shows. Be sure, if you like the show, if you're into the podcast, head over to iTunes. Even if you don't use iTunes to get the podcast, uh, go on over to iTunes if you've got an account over there or whatever. Find the podcast and leave us a review so we can um, uh, keep the positive reviews rolling in, or at least I should say the honest reviews rolling in. Uh, keep up with those, uh, the, the Glober reviews, the trolls, if you will. Hey, what did you think uh, of Alex Flat Earth Man, a new song, Gravity? Well, I, I, <laughs> once again, I thought it was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it debuted on, on, on uh, Globebusters. <laughs> You think you'll give us permission to air that during the Absolutely. show? Absolutely. Uh, so right. here's, here's something funny. I w I've been uh, communicating with Alex. I'm the one that actually got him on the show. And, uh, and I convinced him to hurry up and get it done for this Sunday. He agreed. <laughs> but then it was like six and a half gigs. And he's trying to upload it. He has crappy internet. And it's failing. You know, This is happening Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. He finally FTPs it to me. Um, and... And I was, it, that didn't work. I was able to convert it, got it to work. So I uploaded it to my channel, uh, unlisted, just in case he couldn't get his up. Literally like an hour or two before the show, he got it up. Uh, I gave it to Bob. He goes, and then just when the show went live, I, uh, you know, when he did it, I made mine public and he made his public. And, okay. And wait, wait. The funny thing is, the satanic forces are <laughs> getting at everybody because people started attacking me. Like this is bullshit. This was uploaded for his. You know, something's not right here. You know, and like you took it, you stole it from the show. You know, you should. And I'm just like, oh, what the goodness. hell is wrong with people? <laughs> oh man. Well, I love every song. I, I think Bob said this, and he he took the words right out of my mouth. I love each song he's put out more than the one before. Right. They just keep getting better and better. Uh, what an incredible talent to have on the side of the floor. And you hear his voice compared to his singing voice? Yes, yes, <laughs> he, amazing. Yeah, he's, he, yeah, he, he sounded could, like I our last never. guest. And, uh, yeah, he sounded more like he should be on Luke's English podcast. Right. Uh, but, he, but he's doing the, um, the rockabilly stuff, the country stuff. It was great. Yeah. Nothing so, yeah. is real in this world. Not even his accent. I thought he was a cowboy. <laughs> I know everything's an illusion. Uh, so how about we do this, Dave? We're going to let's let's talk about our guests coming up here in a second. And then we'll we'll uh, play Flat Earth Man's new song. But coming up, we've got Sophia Smallstrom on the show with us to talk about some of the things she's into Flat Earth and, and other items. You know, Sophia very well from the truth movement. She is an incredible researcher. Tell us a little bit more about Sophia and what she's doing now. Most of you know who she is, but, um, you know, she came onto the scene as far as I uh, discovered her was, was with 9-11 Mysteries, um, which is one of the first 9-11 exposing documentaries and it was uh amazing you know then he, she went on from there to do um the morgellons uh chemtrails and morgellons research which if you haven't seen that it's a two-part series on youtube um it, it'll the first one will blow you away the second one will make you uh never ever go outside again oh. uh, 
and uh, she's done work with, uh, you know, Jan- Janice Barcelo, she introduced me to, um, who does stuff about birth trauma and, and, and how we're brought into this world and, and how, how totally screwed up it is. Um, She's done tons of research into uh, cellular radiation, all these frequencies that are hammering us and ways to mitigate it. Um, she is the one that got me to drink turpentine. <laughs> oh, nice. uh, for that, we can, I can get into that. But there's so many things that this woman over the last 10 years or, or however long it's been has taught me um, that it has totally changed my life. I, I, um, I never go to a doctor. I never get sick. I never take a vaccine. I think most of the people that listen to this realize that. Um, and I have to give Sophia lots of the credit. You know, there's supplements here, supplements there you can take. She has me doing a few things that um, I think I'll just always be doing. And I wanted to share them with your with the audience. So um, if you think this upcoming segment is a giant commercial, well, you might be right. You might be wrong. It's basically trying to share the information that I have that has changed my life. Um, you know, and the stuff that she tells you about, you can get it yourself. You can go anywhere and get it. Uh, um, yeah, it, yeah. Probably for the same price, maybe for less, maybe for more because, uh, you know, she can ship you everything together, which she'll tell you about. And, you know, it's, it's, it's life changing stuff when when we were talking about this before we went on the air about how well some people might think it uh, you know we're, we've gone commercial when we start talking about some of our products turn it off but, right now if but, that's what you think turn it off right now you think you've that's got fine. your flat earth stuff um yeah that's why we did overtime on the uh the, yeah. the, the the other topics um but i i think i you know the best analogy i can bring up is this you know Sophia is somebody who has put an incredible amount of time into her research on all of these topics, like you mentioned, 9-11, Sandy Hook. And, you know, it's the equivalent of, look, if I found out that Jaron was selling toothpicks on the side, uh, in addition to doing all the incredible research and videos that he's been giving us, you know what? I would get on here for free. Jaron doesn't have to give me anything. And I would say, you know what? Order your toothpicks from Jaron because, you know, you got to get your toothpick somewhere, right? It helps someone in our community that's that's doing work for the truth. So if you're looking to improve your life with, without supplements, understand certain things about your health, listen to the interview because it's really good. And, you know, she's a flat earther. Boom. There you go. Yeah. You know, and she explains things so well, so meticulously, you know, she, her mind is completely different than mine. And, you know, we'll be talking for, for, you know, about long things and, you know me, whenever there's an opportunity to stick in a joke, I'll stick it in. And when I stick a joke in with her and Mike Williams, Sage of Quay, uh, same thing, you know, he's kind of the same personality. Uh, we get crickets in return. We get, we get <laughs> nothing. Um, we've actually taught her, you know, like if we get her to laugh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle. But she's actually gotten quite better because of Mike and I constantly trying to make her laugh. Um, <laughs> but I was so nervous for this interview <laughs> because because she's it's like all right I don't want to say anything that's going to upset her um but it went really well as far as our interview except tinfoil hat something was stopping we had the most incredible technical difficulties so explain what was happening Jay yeah so we, the three of us are talking and it literally starts with okay Dave's audio is fine my audio is fine but Sophia's has got about a two second delay. And so we're hearing an echo. So we ask her a question, Sophia, great to have you on. And she starts to say, thank you. But we hear Sophia, great to have you on total echo. So we're like, all right, we couldn't fix it. We'll just roll with it. Let's just do it and we'll ignore it. So we get her to mute her microphone, but over the course of the interview, the echo starts growing and growing to the point where it's like literally about 20 to 30 seconds <laughs> of a delay. I mean, it was ridiculous. We, yeah, we weren't able to hear the end of her. Sometimes she would mute herself before before the her delay caught up. And so we wouldn't hear the end of her sentence. So then we're sitting there, you know, so 
Jay is going to piece this all together. It's it's yeah. it's going to be like that uh like uh 12 monkeys where they get the messages from the <laughs> past and they have to piece yes. them together. Um yes, so I'm going to If you hear any weird edits and stuff, it's because we're hiding information about the flat earth. Um, right, of it, course. It's only because Jay isn't as good as he says he is at editing. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> so hopefully you'll enjoy the interview. We've got a long and a really great discussion with Sophia coming up. Let's skip the break. We'll save that for later. Let's go ahead and hit the Flat Earth Man's latest single, and then we'll go straight into the interview with Sophia. Does that sound good? Song in the middle of the show, man. What are you doing? <laughs> I think it's great. Let's do it. Come on. Right, throw it in. All right. So here's Gravity from Flat Earth Man. And when we come back, we'll have Sophie on the line. But when I learned in school about gravity, it was so cool. I had a teacher that knew it all. She taught me how water could stick to a ball, how buildings stick to the underside of a ball that spins like a carousel ride. Man, it all sounded crazy to me, but I love learning about gravity. I couldn't wait to tell my dad about the amazing day that I had. He picked me up, I was bursting with pride. He opened up the door and I jumped inside. He smiled at me and said, how was your day? I said, Dad, I was blown away. I learned about this magical thing, but it's kind of got my head in the spin. I learned about this Newton guy. When an apple fell on his head, he surmised that there must be a force that's pulling it down. And everything's being sucked to the ground A force that sticks us all to this ball The people, the buildings, the oceans and all So it was written in history Newton had discovered gravity Well, he just looked at me and said Don't believe in gravity Don't believe in fantasy They teach it to the kids. Well, my dad felt a little bit sad for me when I mentioned that word gravity. He said, have a little independent thought. A question what you've just been taught. I mean... How the hell could a ball that spins make a force so strong that sucks everything in? Yet birds and insects fly unaffected. Gravity must be so selective. Think about it logically, cause that don't make no sense to me. You gotta question all those preachers preach, question all those teachers teach. You see, gravity is just a bunch of bull. That Newton guy's just a lying fool. These guys like Newton shouldn't be trusted. Their free Masonic lies have been busted In fact, my boy, it's density And that's why things fall down, you see An object always falls to the ground If it's heavier than the air that surrounds If it's lighter than air, then it'll rise It'll keep on floating up to the skies That's what's known as buoyancy And that makes more sense than gravity So let me tell you one more time, boy don't believe in gravity Don't believe in fantasy Don't believe cause the theory's all it is It's never been proven But they teach it to the kids He said, I'm sorry, son, for bursting your bubble, but that kind of thinking can get you in trouble. These theories they try to put in your head, it's all just pseudoscience, he said. They'll have you believing in all kinds of crap. That gravity nonsense belongs in the trash. Believe me when I say to you, there ain't no gravity, and that's the truth. Well, my daddy made me think that day. 
He made me think in a different way. I did some thinking for myself. I put that theory back on the shelf. That gravity crap is indoctrination, not truthful, trusted information. People need to wake up and see there ain't no such thing as gravity. You let me hear you sing it one more time now. Don't believe in gravity. But they teach it to the kids. One more time now. Don't believe in gravity. Don't believe in fantasy. Don't believe cause the theory's all it is. It's never been proven. But they teach it to the kids. Special guest with us here today, Dave. Uh, I know it's someone you know well, and I know her work very well. Uh, a very thorough researcher, one of the best out there. I caught on to her early on, I think uh, a couple of years ago, watching the uh, Sa- the Sandy Hook spectacular video she did, the two, three, four, and five dimensions. Uh, then that led me to her 9-11 research. And, and, you know, I'll say this, I had no clue once I got into Flat Earth that Sophia was in a Flat Earth. You were the one that bridged that for me, Dave. And our special guest today is your friend, Sophia Smallstorm. Sophia, how are you? I'm fine. I really appreciate uh, both of you fitting this into your tight, very busy schedules. Thank you. Sophia, I don't know if you are aware that you are the person that got me to look into flat earth. You and I were having a conversation about all of the insanity in the world, one thing after another. And we're like, it's totally crazy. And right at the end of the conversation, you said to me, you know, you think that's crazy. For all I know, the earth could be flat. And I had been barraged with people telling me to look into flat earth. And I've been blocking them as I've told the story a hundred times. And you said that, and that's the night I started looking into Flat Earth um, and tried to debunk it, and here I am on the Flat Earth Podcast. David, I did not know that little bit of the timeline. I, I'm sure in the history of your life, it's a crucial turning point, but I do know that around that time we were talking, a friend of mine had phoned me and urged me to look into the Flat Earth, and I thought he was a nutcase. <laughs> and I told him, I said, no, I am not going to look at this. And he reasoned with me. He gave me two or three of the flat earth perspective arguments on the phone in a very relaxed, low-key, intelligent way. And I decided, well, you know what? I don't have any grounds to refute that or debunk it or rebut it. And now I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to use my own eyes. And I went to the beach that afternoon took a long walk, and I was looking at the people. I mean, there were people collecting shells and that kind of thing, walking, and I felt so sorry for them. I thought, those poor people, they don't know that the earth is flat. What a terrible thing. That's that's right when you you told me about it, and and, and it, it literally, it was at the perfect moment because I think that day I had probably a half a dozen emails and instant messages of people sending me flat earth stuff. And I, and I couldn't take it anymore. And I still was refusing to look at it, but then, you know, you know, I trust uh, lots of the research that you do or all of it basically. And I started looking and uh, you're the reason that this podcast exists. (laughs) I think you're being too generous. I have, I say to people, I am still, on a discussion level. There's only one or two small things that I've discovered on my own that I've brought to the Flat Earth community to seek an explanation. And so far, I've not received a thorough explanation of the phenomena that I am referring to. Um, But the ball earth certainly can explain it. So I can't say that I'm a researcher per se, because I do not do some of the things that these other people do. They measure and they make very, um, you know, the AutoCAD um, diagrams and so forth. I just have used 
uh, my own senses and what I have learned in terms of, for instance, this almanac finding that you and I talked about on another show, David. But anyway, we won't get into, we won't get bogged. Actually, I, I just like to mention that because there's a lot of uh, good researchers that listen to this show um, that might take that information and make something of it. So just real quick without digging in, um, it's something that Sophia has uh, coined as daytime creep. Is that what it is, Sophia? I knew you would mess it up. Sunrise, <laughs> sunset, creep. Sunrise, sunset, creep. And it started, I'll t- go, I'll refresh everyone on what this is. So a lifeguard in his 50s told me not to continue to wait with bated breath for the winter solstice when I believed we were going to start getting longer evenings and this whole nasty phase of being descended into darkness at four o'clock in the afternoon would end. And that's what everybody thinks. They think, oh, we just have to wait till December 21st and then it will start, it'll turn around. We'll have the longer evenings. He said, no. He said, look, the evenings are already longer. And we were around December 15th. This was a couple of years ago. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the sunset starts to back off in the first week of December after the 7th or so. And he says, the sun rises later. It's later till the first week of January after the 7th or so. I said, what? And he said, yeah, the 21st, it has nothing to do with it. That's just in terms of time, sheer time. That is going to be the longest night and the shortest day. And of course, the inverse applies to June, June 21st. So I said, I don't believe you. And I ran to my car, got my tide chart, which is an almanac of sorts, and looked it up because that has the sunset time listed and sunrise. He was right. It's actually around December 12th and June 12th. And then there's a correlating January 12th or 13th and July 12th or 13th. So our nights get shorter around that December 12th turning point. And yet the sun continues to rise later and later in the morning all the way to January 12th or 13th. And the same for the summer. June 21st is, in terms of sheer time, the longest day and the shortest night. But we are already starting to have our sunsets creep up as of June 12th or so. And our sun rises continue to be earlier and earlier until July 12th or so. And this pertains to the entire world. You can look up sunset times in Perth, Australia, in Bangkok, wherever you want to look. It's the same thing. So that's what I was looking for an explanation for. And so that was, and that was early on in your flat earth journey, Sophie, correct? That, that wasn't, I mean, that was one of the initial things that got you started in this? Well, that was one of the things that I brought. It was like, I was a little dog bringing a slipper to my owner, and the owner being in this scenario, the flat earth experts. Here's my slipper that I have found, or he, like a cat bringing a mouse in the door. Right. So my, my quick analysis of it is the reason that it creeps is because it's not a um, – it's a change in the speed and it's either a change in the speed of the spin of the earth or a change in the speed of the cycle of the sun going around the earth. And I think it's pretty obvious that if the spin of the earth was changing, we'd all know it. Um, But I'd really like somebody that's better at this analysis and AutoCAD or whatever program they can use to, uh, to look into that. And, and I think it's a, a ball, spinning ball killer. Let me ask you this, Dave. Could it also be uh, that the sun is ascending or descending during that period? Because if it gets higher, it wouldn't have to change the speed. It would just look faster or slower from our perspective. So if you believe in the cycling sun, you know, that goes out wider, um, you know, during the the inner northern hemisplains winter, um, speeding up and then comes back in, slowing down. There has to be an acceleration and a deceleration of that outward movement and inward movement. Um, and, and that's something that's just not 
constant. It, it speeds up and slows down right. if that's what you believe. But there's 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 actually several explanations that that could work. And I am not pertaining uh, com- pertaining. What's the word to know the answer? Uh, pretending, pretending. Yeah. pretending. Yeah. So listen, when I talked to Bob and Cammy, when I talked to Bob and Cammy, they had um, developed their their grid of the magnetic flux lines. And I my suspicion, it was just a sense, and I had really very little to explain this with, was that the sun was hitting, it was doing a boing kind of thing. And there was a flux line issue. It was hitting its flux point. And it was that would you see because if it's true that the sun circles out to the tropic of um, Capricorn, is that the one in the lower hemisphere Correct. supposedly? Yes. Yeah. So then when it hits that, it has to receive some kind of information, or it has to start coming back. And it w- there's a wobble. David, you and I came up with this wobble idea very early on, and the same with Tropic of Cancer. It arrives to its max uh, maximum point of advance and then it has to start receding and it is doing something it's wobbling or boinging or the the thing i don't know how to explain it beyond that there's some point at which it receives this return signal or begins to make its return that's the best i can do so anyone who can improve that there's a lot of room for improvement you, you know, you brought up something about Bob and Cammy's map with the magnetic declination. Have you guys looked into that? Because I, I, about a year, maybe a little over a year ago, last June, I got really into researching the magnetic declination lines of the uh, so-called globe. And it was one of my early areas of, of specific areas of research because back in my old job, I used to work on oil rigs years ago. And one of the things we did when we would drill was – you know, the company that I was working for would put a computer system at the bottom of these uh, drill strings. And one of the things that we always had to do was we had to set, uh, tell it where north was. And so during our academy, when we went to this academy, we learned all about this magnetic declination. What I've, when I looked into this flat earth, I, I thought there might be a connection. And I remember looking back at my notes from this, this job and I was like, wait a minute, the magnetic declination was never off very much in the areas that we drilled. And so when I dove into that area of research, I found some really fishy things. It's like the magnetic declination didn't even come about until I think the late 16 or early 1700s. Prior to that, ships were sailing all over the world without the use of uh, magnetic declination correction. That's, uh, uh, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, it, it's so there's so many things that have no explanation uh, when you look at it uh, you know, from the globe view. Yeah, it's just like nowadays they tell us we have to correct our compass to these magnetic lines of the Earth, and uh, if not, you're gonna, you know, you'll, you'll go shipwrecked or a plane will disappear or whatever if you if you don't get it right. But how did they do it prior to the 1600s? You know, how are they finding places uh, without this so-called correction? And that was a huge red flag early on in my research. I didn't know if you guys had looked into that a lot or not. But listen, the magnetic declination, I am, that is like way over my head. I just brought in my little um, dead mouse, which is the sunrise, sunrise sunset creep. And I can't, I'm not really a researcher. Sophia, you, you um, so I'll just a question and we can move on to some of the more stuff that I really want to talk to you about. Um, would you, without putting yourself in a group, because the whole group idea is, is crazy, because there's crazy people everywhere, um, would you consider yourself a flat earther? Well, again, I, I am willing to accept that the earth is flat. So if that makes me a flat earther, fine. <laughs> Bully for me. But what I'd like to say is I don't have every argument under the sun to discuss and rebut the various theories that are proffered and kicked around on this playground. I simply had issues with the ball earth and the seasons, especially when I was a child. I really had issues with that. I could not understand how when we are 
supposedly farthest away from the sun, we are having summer. How is that? How does that make any sense at all? That makes, never works makes for no me. sense. Right. It doesn't. Right. And they, they tell you, oh, it's the angle. We're just tilted. Right. My, my angle is that if it's the angle, then at sunrise every day, summer or winter, it should be freezing because that's the most severe angle. So it doesn't make sense that at sunrise, uh, it's not freezing and that at noon on any day of the year, it's not warmer than sunrise. Well, at noon, it is warmer than sunrise, but not by that many degrees, not that enough degrees to make uh, well, it a I mean, season worth of difference. What I meant is noon on December 21st versus sunrise on June 21st. The The angle of the sun at noon on December 21st is far more direct than at sunrise at June. I've made this point many times. Um, and, and ballers just ignore that. They're like, well, you know, and they don't say anything because, you know, when it's one degree off the horizon, you can't get any more severe than that, you know, except a half a degree. Um, but at noon on December 21st, you might be at a 45 degree angle. Uh, it should be warmer, but it's not. So it's distance, not angle. Right. The angle makes a tiny bit of a difference. Right. I said it shouldn't make a season's worth of difference. Like it shouldn't feel like summer or winter in the span of one simple day. Right. Or is that off the mark? No, no, I, I agree with what she's saying. It, it doesn't make sense. I wanted to ask Sophia because Dave was telling me about it. Sophia, you started a, um, some products and I don't know anything about it. I know Dave does. So You've got someone on the line that knows about them and then someone else who hasn't heard anything about them except that they're called Flat Earth Minerals. And I wanted to ask you first, before you explain what they are, why the name Flat Earth Minerals? All right. So I switched from being a DVD store to being a store that offered for sale some of the things that I had discovered as I hit, as I crossed the age 50 uh, mark. That I, things that I discovered that really turned me around in terms of how I felt. I'm not speaking in terms of curing diseases or I'm not speaking as though I'm a healthcare practitioner. But there are things that are available to us still, thank you, that are very simple. They are not expensive formulations. There's no pyramid network marketing. These are simple things that changed my let's just say the course of how I felt in a radical way such that I had to start sharing this with other people. And I would say to you now that all of them relate to the earth. And the fact is that we need, we are electrical. We are electrical and electromagnetic. And you can say God made us that way, or you can say that's just how life is. Life is electricity. And on the cellular level, we are constantly needing electrons. So electrons, which no one has ever seen, these subatomic particles, they are the tiny little elements that keep us going. And in order to facilitate that electron exchange on the cellular level, to make sure that your cells have enough uptake of electrons and aren't losing too many electrons in how much work they're doing and they're not getting any back to sustain themselves and keep themselves going. Bioelectricity, it's called. It has to do with biochemistry, biophysics, and all of it relates to the earth, all of it. You've absolutely got to have sunlight. Sunlight gives you electrons. The photons coming into your eyes kick off vitamin D production, which kicks off hundreds of biological activities in your body. You cannot live in what's called biological darkness. You absolutely need, you need to have a very important mineral, which actually in its most uh, fundamental state is a metal, and that would be iodine. And another one is magnesium. And there are reasons in our modern world why we need more of this than we would have needed, say, 100 or 200 years ago when the earth was saner, the world was not full of this much toxin, and we didn't have addictions to this many 
technologies that are stripping us, ruining our electrical configurations. So, Sophia, you and I, uh, you know, over the years, uh, you have turned me on to so many things that have literally changed my life and and going starting from uh you know you say we need these electrons you introduced me to grounding and um i i sleep on a grounding strip that i got from you i uh, stand on a grounding mat when i am at my stand-up desk and i'm outside barefoot i've done that my whole life um you know whenever i if i don't feel well i go outside barefoot you know put your feet in the sand stand on the grass lay down and you always feel better uh, immediately um, so just starting with that uh, really um, brings home the point of what you were saying, that we're electrical beings and that we need to be connected to the earth. And I just wanted to thank you for, for that information. Well, you're very welcome, David. And unfortunately, our modern lives have taken us really away and off the ground, away from the sky and off the ground. We live indoors. We live sometimes at elevation. We live on the second floor, third floor, fourth floor, and we're not getting enough of the negative charge. All right, so it is theorized that lightning hits the earth 200 times a second. Doesn't matter where. And this electricity, the lightning bolt striking the earth, are creating a mild electron flow in the ground. And the ground is conductive. It's principally made of water, which is conductive, and minerals, quartz, silica, all kinds of minerals are conductive. And then soil has a mixture of water and minerals. Even the desert earth is mineral-based. So we have conductivity, a very mild, you could call it a current, or you could call it an electron flow in the ground. And... Because we're principally water, we are conductive as well. And every living thing has evolved such that that mild electron flow is a benefit. It's a very important natural benefit. It's a life energy booster. So plants get the electron flow. Animals, your dog, when he's snuffling around in the bushes, his wet nose and his paws are picking up electrons. But you... In your rubber-soled shoes, you, in your apartment on the third floor, or even your first-floor apartment with its carpet or its sealed flooring, you're not getting any electrons. And that means that we are taking our electrons out of food processing. And that, in my opinion, and in the opinion of only a very few number of scientists, I've discussed this with one of them, a biophysicist, we are not supposed to get the majority of our electron transfer out of what's called donated electrons from food. It principally comes from the breakdown of fats and carbohydrates. And when you're living off the ground, everybody is scarfing down fats and carbohydrates. They're eating too much. That's why we have an obesity epidemic in part. So when you go outside, when you walk barefoot, even 50, 60 years ago, children walked to school on dirt paths, on sidewalks that are conductive. Concrete is conductive. Tar is not. And men walked to work in their leather-soled shoes, which are conductive, and they received electron transfer. But now, even the expensive men's shoes in the fine stores have rubber soles, and people don't walk. They take the, you know, transportation, the train, or they drive. And they don't go outside. They don't fill their eyes with the blue sky. And we, of course, have a filtration going on in the form of chemtrails. So we're getting a very altered light form that's coming into our eyes. And that doesn't kick off the vitamin D production, which means you're living in biological darkness. The new light bulbs are not creating any heat. They are cold blue light, and they don't produce yellow thermal light, which is what sunlight is, firelight is, proper daylight. So we don't get the vitamin D production and the consequent hundreds of biological actions and exchanges that depend on light, photons, and electrons kicking us into gear when we wake up every day. So that's why I propose grounding, because yes, when you ground, you walk barefoot, you garden, people love to garden, they find it very relaxing, because their fingers are drawing electrons in from the soil. 
And we w love to walk, everybody who goes to the beach, unless they have some kind of foot problem, I've noticed that even old people, they like to take their shoes off and walk barefoot because they come home supplied with millions and millions of electrons that go into an actual substance in your body called ground substance. It's between the tissues and the electrons that you've received from the outdoors are banked in that ground substance and your body does repairs with them all night long. So let me ask you a question. Um, I have a grounding strip that you made yourself um, that you, um, I know that you sold them in the past and I don't know if they're still available. I know that many people want them. So I'm asking you, is that something that you are actively selling to the public? Because I love it. It's a strip that wraps around my mattress. My skin lays on top of it and it uses the grounding circuits in your house, the ground of your plug, which actually, for those of you that don't know, have a direct connection to a rod that is stuck in the ground. So literally you are connected to the ground. Is that something that people can get from you? And if not, where can they get something like that? All right. So I'll lay it out, David, since you've forced me. You've put me in, as you would say in your neighborhood, a corner. Okay? Laugh, laugh. Yeah, yeah. I was on mute. I laughed on All mute. All right. <laughs> so I enhanced a grounding system that was designed by a friend of mine. I improved it in several ways. It's very small, it's very compact, it's very portable. The bed strip that you referred to is an accessory, it's an add-on product that I designed, you could call it invented. They're now made for me by a sewing contractor that I have, and they're made of silver mesh fabric. They're very narrow, they're only six inches wide, so they're not cumbersome, you can travel with it, put it on a hotel bed, but you need the basic grounding assembly that comes with it, which is the starter product, and it's slightly over a hundred dollars, and it gives you the option of grounding with resistance or going straight to ground. That's how it's an improvement over the commercial products, the mat that you were speaking of, that's available online, grounding mats and grounding sheets. Um, I don't sell this online to the public at large because in my experience, grounding requires a lot of coaching, a lot of personal support. And I cannot have an avalanche of orders and give this kind of time and support to everyone. What I also have noticed is that people who have Wi-Fi or stressful lives or are on their cell phones a lot or don't take care of themselves in a basic way, meaning they're on the standard American diet with the standard American stress, they don't respond well to grounding as a rule. So they come back to me and say that the thing doesn't work and they want to return it. And taking returns is a big pain in the butt. So I recommend that only really certain people are good candidates for grounding. That's not to say that grounding doesn't help everyone because it does. But if you are eating well, meaning you're eating a high fiber, organic, sensible in terms of what modern health discoveries have arrived at diet. You are taking pains to eliminate radio frequency microwaves from your life and lifestyle. And you seek exercise and get lots of fresh air. You're a good candidate for grounding. You're probably going to notice an improvement in your well-being very quickly if you invest in a grounding product. But if you are, if you don't meet all three of those criteria, don't expect much when it comes to grounding. And it takes too much energy for me to beg people to stop carrying their cell phone around, unplug your Wi-Fi at night. I just can't give everybody hands-on guidance and direction as to how to improve their lifestyles that to make them a good candidate for grounding. I've taken your advice. I uh, don't unplug my Wi-Fi, but I have a infrared uh, on off switch that the Wi-Fi is plugged into. So when I go to bed, I hit that switch, turn off my Wi-Fi and I lay on my grounding strip and I sleep very well for the little sleep that I do allow myself, you know, um, I only get a few hours sleep some nights. Um, but I am full of energy all day. I feel terrific. And, and I'm wondering, um, if it's because of all of these, it's not that many things, but these other products that I'm taking, 
um, that really have have given me energy. I don't worry about how much sleep I get. Um, I get as much sleep as I need. And sometimes that's three hours. Sometimes it could be six hours. But I just kind of go with the flow. And uh, I, I believe that, you know, the Wi-Fi, the grounding, and um, these other things that we're going to talk about in a moment uh, are a big factor of it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a total subscriber to everything she mentioned as far as you know, uh, we don't we don't touch the ground enough. We don't get out there enough. The, we are missing the electrons. I I totally agree. So tell me, uh, as far as the the products go, what do you have in those that I guess to supplement uh, what we're so severely lacking these days, Sophia? Well, again, I would say to anyone who is seeking an improvement in well being and who is skeptical, because most people are, you know, they think that you're just trying to sell them something. And that's a little bit insulting to me because I go to lengths to give an explanation as to why I'm recommending this or that. For instance, I had a farmer's market booth for nearly five years and I was interacting with mainstream, coastal mainstream, highly affluent public. And they would come by my booth and I would try to introduce them to magnesium cream. It was the easiest thing to sell because almost everybody's got some kind of joint pain or stiff neck. The stuff works in literally less than a minute for most people. And I, it's $10. $10. I mean, how much are you asking people to spend? $10 is not a lot. And for the kind of improvement it gives you, mind-blowing. And I would explain the utility and the benefit of magnesium, how it's the dominant ion in the cell. It's yielded to the bloodstream to keep the major organs going. And I'm going to give you something that right now that I worked out on my very own. The body's main concerns in terms of organ functionality are the heart, lungs, and brain. That's what it wants to keep going. The body doesn't care if you have a broken ankle. As long as it can keep your heart going, that's what it wants to do. So I figured out after watching old people, because we have snowbirds here, they come from Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, the Midwest, they, even Canada, they come and they winter here. We call them the snowbirds. I live in Southern California. And I would watch these snowbirds struggle past my booth, leaning over walkers, huffing and puffing. They were fat, their skin looked like hell like parchment, white paper. Their joints made ankles swollen, joints that barely functioned, atrophied muscles, and yet their hearts, lung, heart, lung, and brains were going. And that to me was a direct demonstration of the body's prioritization, and I would offer them magnesium cream. And they would turn me down because they never heard of it. Their doctor doesn't talk about it. And somebody at a booth is trying to sell them something. Okay, so the body will sacrifice the health of the cells in secondary and tertiary systems, meaning your muscles, your bones, your skin. Body doesn't care. If it has to pull nutrients out of those cells, it'll do it to give it to the heart, lungs, and brain. And that's why so many old people spend so many years in degenerative decline. And they leave the world ailing and failing. Sophia, so the magnesium cream, I actually have a bunch of tubes. I have one at the gym. I have in my kitchen. I have it in my bathroom. Um, and I use it. And you're right. It works within minutes. I get a knot in my neck or something aches. Um, it It's amazing. Do you do – what about taking magnesium internally? Uh, you 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 have some. Uh, I have the magnesium flakes, but I don't really use them. I just been using the cream. Is that what most people? What you recommend for most people? Well, that is one of the most directly observable um, benefits of magnesium. Magnesium. Okay, picture your cell. Your cell has the cytoplasm inside. It's got the nucleus. There's a lot of biological. Uh, you know. A very important work going on inside each cell. And magnesium is the dominant ion in the cell. It's a very important mineral. 
it neutralizes metabolic acids. It is very important for enzymatic activity, enzymes. And our organs have to have the correct pH to work. So they need the correct extracellular pH, which means how acidic is the blood that's bringing them the nutrients that they need for their upkeep. Okay, so if there's too much acid in the blood, magnesium is yielded, it's pulled, it's yanked from inside the cells to correct the balance because the body wants to get the blood right so that it could keep those major organs going. So magnesium alkalinizes, it neutralizes pH in the bloodstream. That's why it's so very important. It also relaxes muscles. It, it provokes and promotes smooth muscle motility. So when you have a knot in your neck and you put the magnesium on, it'll do that to striated muscle as well. It will relax that knot. It opens up tissues so that healing can occur more easily. Blood can arrive because now these channels... In, in the body are open more. Calcium constricts and rigidifies everything. It works kind of in tandem with, but also kind of in opposition to magnesium. The body wants both, calcium and magnesium. Calcium makes things hard and tight, and it makes you hurt. Magnesium makes things open and soft, and it makes you relaxed. So this is how you can actually promote healing. When you have an injury, not only do you have inflammation, soreness, redness, all of that, which is the body's own way of bringing in repair materials. The inflammatory process is a repair process. When you add magnesium, it keeps those blood vessels open. It keeps those lymphatic vessels transporting waste, deporting waste. And a lot of people in America are constipated, constant issues with constipation. Don't take laxatives. Take a magnesium product, which they're formulated for internal consumption, it's usually magnesium citrate. There's a very popular product called Calm, C-A-L-M. You take a teaspoon of Calm powder in water or orange juice once a day, and you don't have a constipation problem anymore. Because magnesium moves smooth muscles, and that's what your GI tract is. It's smooth muscle. So magnesium can help in so many ways, and a tube of magnesium, if you put a little cream or you spray a little magnesium spray on your skin, not only can you direct the magnesium to where you have a pain issue at that very moment and it'll work very fast, but the magnesium itself is going to enter your bloodstream as it gets absorbed by the skin and then it's going to travel around and it's going to benefit you. That was my next question was, um, if, can you just put it, if you put it on, does it affect your whole body? And you just answered that. Um, there's so much to say about magnesium uh, that we can go on for a whole show on it, but I want to get to two other things. One other is iodine. Everyone's heard about iodine, but nobody takes it. And, uh, and I take it um, daily and I kind of let my intuition tell me how much to take it. Can you tell us a little bit how uh, the mineral, uh, it is mineral, right? Iodine um, affects us and why we need it so much and why we don't have it. Yes, I can. Um, iodine, actually, to my surprise, it is actually a metal, just like magnesium. A lot of these things that our body needs in various you know, amounts, it needs certain metals in trace amounts. It needs right now a decent amount of iodine as well as magnesium. There are reasons for that. Magnesium, the reason is the acidosis in the body, which is the platform for um, disease. Disease develops in acidic environments. Iodine is the most important element for the body because it is the primary um, atom in your thyroid hormone. It is one of the primary uh, components. Your thyroid is this gland in your neck and it produces four hormones that are referred to as T1, T2, T3, and T4. And the thyroid is one of your master regulators, glandular regulators. Those hormones travel all over your body and they get things going. Hormones are uh, messengers. You could call them messenger chemicals. But um, your thyroid needs iodine. T1 has one atom of iodine. T2 has two. 
T3 has 3 and T4 has 4. T4 is thyroxine. It's a very important hormone for the brain. This is why a lot of people have brain fog today because they don't have the correct material in their thyroxine that their thyroid is making because they're iodine deficient. So what's happening, here's where it will all fall into place for the modern awake listener. Iodine, if you look at it in the periodic table, lines up with bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. They are in a family called the halogens. They're called a family because they're very similar in their atomic um, mass, their electromagnetic charge, which is negative, and their basic, they are both um, diatomic molecules. They like to be with a twin, so iodine is I2, uh, chlorine is Cl2, and bromine is also bonded with another bromine, and fluorine is F2. So they are recognized by the body. The body, I call the body a blind man. The body is not used to chemicals and compounds and molecules that it doesn't encounter in nature. And when something floats in that's man-made, that's a similar shape, a similar electromagnetic charge, has a similar feel to something that the body is used to, it says, oh, that's it. This is what I have. The body looks for iodine. It grabs chlorine, which is everywhere in our lives. It's in our drinking water. We clean our houses with it. It grabs fluorides, which are lining, you know, food containers now, the Teflon pans. It's in your drinking water if you live in certain parts of the country. Bromides, bromine. And the body goes, oh, good. This is iodine. Because it thinks that this similar molecule is the thing it normally uses, which is iodine. In nature, bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, are, they don't get into organisms that easily in an unsafe form. So, um, for instance, sodium chloride is salt, salt water, but we need the sodium in our blood, and the chloride is used to make hydrochloric acid. But in when you're getting just deluged with bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, the way that we are in modern life, those molecules, they sit on our iodine receptors in our body, throughout our body, and they fool it. And what I learned from Dr. Brownstein, who's an iodine expert, was that the poor thyroid is making fluoridated thyroid hormone brominated thyroid hormone and chlorinated thyroid hormone instead of making thyroid hormones with iodine in it. And that stuff is going to your various organs and trying to messenger. And that's what's toxifying us. So we need to have, I would say, a copious amount of iodine compared to the trace amount that we might have needed in another age. Because that iodine presence sitting on your cell receptors doesn't allow bromine, chlorine, and fluorine to come in and take over. Jay, th- I've talked to Sophia so many times about this stuff that it, um, it, it's, it's just amazing to me, but it, it is a little mind-blowing. How are you handling getting all of this information for the first time? I'm, 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 <laughs> believe it or not, I'm rapidly taking notes as she's, as she's saying all this because, um, again, I, you know, I've always been a believer in the fact that the food we take in, the air we breathe in uh, for the last, I don't know, 30, 40, however many years is not beneficial to our lives. I've been a big subscriber of that. So anytime someone offers up information like this, you know, I'm one of those that that absorbs it and um, studies it and and eventually becomes a believer in it. So, yeah, I've just been totally taking notes this entire time. It's not about believing, you know, I, I, again, I hear the stuff, I take it with a grain of salt and uh, I'm, I'm, I've been generally in good health most of my life, all of my life. And when you take something to improve your health, when you're in good health, you really have to look carefully to say, is it improving my health? You know, do I really feel a difference? Um, but when I've taken a good hard look, I haven't been to the doctor in years. I don't remember the last time I went to the doctor. I, but when I went, it was a long time ago. It's because I had a sinus infection. And that's only because I wasn't taking the proper things. Now, if I start getting, you know, uh, if I feel you know, something going on, a cough or whatever, um, I take natural stuff that cures it, makes it better much faster. But honestly, since I've been taking the iodine, since I've been 
using magnesium. And since I've been taking Restore, which we're going to talk about next, um, I haven't felt any sort of sickness except perhaps a little cough in my throat. And that's just because I'm a mouth breather. I talk a lot and all of the crap in the air. <laughs> you mentioned the Restore to me. That's the only thing you had mentioned to me before. And I was like, oh, yeah, I definitely want to hear more about that. That whatever, whatever it was that you told me it definitely struck a chord with me because I was like, yeah, I'll, I'd love to try that. Tell me about Restore. Okay. I, I already talked about magnesium, which is $10 to start. Iodine, you can start it at $12 for a quarter ounce. That's a two-month supply. Um, well, that's at one of my websites. Scratch that. Iodine, you can try for $20 on the Flat Earth Minerals website. And I created this Flat Earth Minerals concept because the Flat Earth is giving us these important minerals, which are fundamentally metals. But anyway, so $10, $20, and now there's Restore. Restore is a little more expensive. But Restore is a brilliant, brilliant creation of the Restore team, which is pretty much headed by Dr. Zach Bush. And I came across an interview with him done by Dr. Mercola. They didn't even talk about Restore in this interview, but they were talking about how limited our gut biome is and how much that affects our bioelectricity. This is all kind of complicated, but I'll start with the basics. And Jay, you were saying that the food we eat doesn't benefit us. Well, even if you were super organic, non-GMO, you ate an absolutely, you know, spiffy, flawless, healthy diet, you still would be running behind in terms of a couple of things in your body. It may interest you to know, Jay, in particular, because David already knows this. Jay, you mentioned that our food isn't serving its true purpose anymore. And there's actually a tremendous reason behind that, which exceeds the idea of, well, if you're eating processed food, then you're not getting much nutrient benefit out of it. But our, our food, if you were the most, you know, flawless, organic, non-GMO, exercise-holic, uh, natural food consumer, you still wouldn't be getting a ton of benefit out of your food. And the reason for that is that we... Um, <laughs> We've lost not only our gut biome, but our soil biome. And there's a connection between the two. So what do I mean by gut biome? Your, your gut starts in your head, and it includes your digestive tract. It goes all the way down to your rectum, but it includes the sinus passages, mucosal tissues. And you have to rely on bacteria living in your gut to digest your food. You cannot digest your food on your own. Bacteria are non-human. They are a different life form altogether. And we have somehow along the line, back in time, we integrated bacteria into our bodies. We incorporated them. Think of us as a corporation. We incorporated another life form, a non-human life form into our bodies to the tune of trillions and trillions of them. And they are the little critters that process our food. They bring the fats and sugars out of the food. And those fats and sugars are delivered through the gut wall to the waiting blood supply that carries those fats and sugars over to our cells. And still, the human body itself, in terms of its human componentry, Componentry cannot do anything with those fats and sugars. We now rely in the cell, we rely on another foreign form of life, the mitochondria that live within the nuclei of our cells. The mitochondria are derived from ancient bacteria. So now here's another non human life form living in us that knows how to pull electrons out of the fats and sugars and pack them into this nano battery that is in all of our cells, sometimes, you know, up to a million in a cell, called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. ATP is the fuel of the cell and your cells need your body weight in ATP every day. That's how much ATP you use to do the basic work of getting through a day. 
you need your body weight in ATP. And ATP gives That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that is a lot. How how does your body how does your body how does it use your entire body weight of ATP? That that's that that I don't I can't make heads or tails of that. So ATP is a nano battery. It's very, very small. Consider it a battery. And when your cells use the electrons from ATP, ATP charges the cell with electrons. ATP is then reduced into its precursors, which are ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and adenosine monophosphates, and a couple of other very basic building blocks. So now it's the job of your mitochondria, those foreign life forms living in your cell, in the nucleus, to say, oh, we got some reduced batteries here. We've got to recharge them with electrons. So my theory is that if you were out there walking on the ground, your body would be pulling in free electrons, and those would contribute to the recharging of your ATP. Those electrons would turn ADP and AMP back into ATP. And one thing grounding does is it reduces your desire for food because you are getting all this energy from the ground, this electricity. So absent being in contact with the ground, you are going to have to pull all your electrons out of food, the digestion of food, which is done by that bacteria in your body. So that's one reason grounding is so important. It assists your cells in getting their electricity. But your cells, regardless have to use so much ATP every day that your body is recycling, it's repacking, reconstituting your body weight in ATP. Does that, now that, have I explained it better for you at this point? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that makes more sense. No, it makes a lot of sense, actually, yeah. So now here is something that I'm going to add from a show I did with Janice Barcello, which it's too wild and I love it and I think she's absolutely right. We are highly crystalline. We have crystal materials in our bones. They're in our tissues, the structured water in the cell. The cytoplasm of the cell is 99% of the cell. The nucleus is 1%. And science just looks at the nucleus. That's all it's curious about. So the cytoplasm of the cell is like the white of an egg. If you picture an egg as a huge cell, the yolk is the nucleus and the cytoplasm is the white of the egg. Well, the cytoplasm in each of our cells is not just composed of plain old water. It's composed of structured water. It's a crystalline water. It's electromagnetic in its, in its um, composition. And that water responds to electricity. And so does so much of our body. The crystalline materials in our body are piezoelectric. Piezoelectric is a term that an electrical engineer taught me many years ago, but nobody talks about it in science. They're using it in nanotech like there's no tomorrow, but biology uses it as well. And all these crystalline materials in our body, they help to create our body's energy. They help to create our body's um, different transactions. And I just discovered that the heart is not a pump. The heart is an electrical charger. It charges your blood with electricity. It does not pump it and push it all the way to your toes. And the blood spirals out of your ascending and descending aorta. And I have my own theory as to how it continues to be recharged and recharged all the way to your toes. My theory is that there are piezoelectric effects going on inside the blood vessels that keep that blood charging and spinning. The blood literally spins down to your toes spins up to your brain and all of this spinning is done through piezoelectricity crystalline materials in the body so the crystalline parts of us Janice proposed to me are intelligent that's where we get our our metaphysical downloads that's where we get our telepathy that's where we get our sixth sense and I think she's absolutely right we are so electric. We're super electric and electromagnetic. This is why we must always be in contact with and experience the sun and the earth. So that's, 
that's very interesting about the water in our cells um, be holding the information. There's been experiments where um, they use water to hold information. Um, you know, Dr. Emoto did his experiments and everything. Um, but I, for, I forget exactly where I heard it from, but I had been looking into it a while ago. Maybe, maybe even you told me that water um, can hold more information than maybe anything else. Was it you that told me that? I'm not sure. I doubt that I said that to you, but you know, it's water is an information bank. Water responds to different forms of information, including our emotions. Ah. So let's talk more about what the restore actually does to your gut. It 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 restores all of these bacteria or life forms to your gut. All right. So what happened, I'll just go back a little bit. As of World War II, with the boom in industry, first they had a bunch of industries supporting the war. I mean, all kinds of stuff, you know, making uh, uranium refineries and whatnot, a lot of metal coatings for all the ships and the parts of war machinery. And then they had synthetic rubber after the war, and they continued, the industrial boom continued, and a lot of these manufacturing sites companies they had a ton of waste coagulating some of it was in barrels on lots behind the plant some of it was in the factory chimneys it was aggregating as what they call flu dust bag house dust chimney dust and they would just scrape this stuff out collect it all and dump it on empty land and that was absolutely uh, forbidden after a while. The EPA got a little more active. America developed an environmental consciousness. And these companies had to dispose of their hazardous waste. They couldn't just dump it. And so somebody had a very brilliant idea at some point. And I mean, it was one of these dark, brilliant ideas. This person said, hey, all these noxious, toxic elements that make up our hazardous waste, they're all in the earth anyway. They're all earth elements. I mean, you know, huh. Uh, manganese, lead, arsenic, titanium, barium, strontium. It's, it's, all, it's all part of the earth. So why don't we just mix this with fertilizer and give it to farmers and they'll put it back in the earth. And that's what was done. We developed what was called chemical fertilizers and we started to use them. And organic only refers to use of chemical pesticides. Organic farmers are allowed to put up to 250 chemicals on their land. I heard this from organic farmers myself. They can put up to 250 chemicals on their crops in their land and in the form of chemical fertilizer. So the chemical fertilizer... Jeez. Yeah. Chemical fertilizer injured the plants, injured the crops. It made them weaker over time. And that brought in the pests, the bugs, the mites, the molds. And now you had a twin industry. Now you needed chemical pesticides. So the two ride together. And we, by using chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides and ripping up the soil with the heavy machinery, tilling fields, just, you know, destroying, hacking up roots of everything, exposing everything to the air. Oxygen is corrosive. That's why it's called oxidation. Oxygen, rust, rust is a corrosive process because of oxygen. So when you expose the soil, everything in it, you chop up the roots of the prairie grass, for instance, in the dust bowl, that's when they first started using modern farming equipment. And they loosened up all the roots of the prairie grass and the winds came and it blew all the topsoil away. So we have eradicated the topsoil of the planet. We're supposed to have something like 200 feet of topsoil and we have two feet, two feet. That's what we've got left on, on the earth. And that's what we're growing our food in. And because we've dumped so many chemicals in the form of pesticides and fertilizers on the soil, we have wiped out the biome of the soil. We have reduced it to all but those forms of bacteria that can survive these, these hazards we've exposed them to. And we've depleted the, the biome. The biome is the spectrum of bacteria living in the soil that are transferred into our bodies by way of our breathing, 
contact, eating. So in our guts, we don't have enough bacteria types because they're not in the soil anymore. So we are supposed to have, ideally, between 20 and 30,000, even upwards of 30,000 different kinds of bacteria living in our gut that we get from the earth. And those bacteria not only break our food down, but they produce a carbon molecule of their own that has to do with their energy supply. And that carbon molecule talks to the mitochondria in our cells. And I'll go over this again, but let me just say now that we are, each of us, not equipped any longer with the bacterial variation that we require. We require a minimum of, minimum of 20,000, if not 30,000 kinds of bacteria, kinds. We have bacteria numbering in the trillions in our body, but we need kinds, different kinds, types. We need 30,000 at least, 20,000 at least. And it takes 44 people together to come up with 10,000 types of bacteria in their gut between them. So we're running each of us at under 10% of the gut biome spectrum. So Restore restores your gut biome. Where does it, where does it come from? Restore is the creation of Dr. Zach Bush who discovered that these carbon molecules that each of these types of bacteria make, they all make a different type of carbon. I refer to them as motorcycle sidecars. If the bacteria is the motorcycle, each bacterial form has a sidecar of carbon that it makes that gives it, it's like a sidecar with your own gas tank on it, that gives the bacterium its own energy. So these motorcycle sidecars, which are actually carbon molecules, different kinds of carbon molecules, they're called metabolites of carbon, they electrically signal to the mitochondria in our cells. And let's say we have 30,000 different kinds of cells and tissues, which is very possible. We need the spectrum of bacteria for the spectrum of carbons that each of them comes with that do the health regulation in our bodies. Our health is seriously dependent on the interaction, the electrical interaction, it's called redox signaling of bacterial foreign forms of life that live in us. So Dr. Bush, when he discovered this, he realized we can't get the biome back because it doesn't exist. Unless you went to the depths of the Amazon where there was no introduction of modern anything or someplace in Africa or someplace in the wild, the biome of the earth has been altered. And you're not going to get a species spectrum anymore, basically anywhere. So he went to the southwest desert in America. And the desert, he reasoned, represents what used to be 200 feet of topsoil because the desert hasn't been farmed with modern, modern methods at all. It just hasn't. It's too old. So even though the desert is now, the earth is compacted, it's dried, the bacteria can't live in it. The bacteria are gone, but the carbons are there. So he made this product restore and it took an awful lot of development to create Restore. I mean, just the way the research that has gone into it, the way that it's distributed, packaged. I mean, this is a super, super product. This is not something somebody cooked up in their bedroom and put in network marketing, right? Restore has the ability to confer, to integrate back into your gut this spectrum of carbon metabolites that your health system needs. And once you start taking Restore, it's in a liquid form. It looks like weak Lipton tea, and it tastes about the same. It will put those carbon metabolites into your gut that start signaling to all your different mitochondria, and your health starts to get regulated again. So uh, we need to actually kind of wrap this up soon. My question to you is, what are some benefits that you've had experience with Restore? What has it done for different groups of people? I started Restore in April. I reasoned that this made complete sense. This was a no-brainer. If I was going to get my health better, I mean, it's already reasonably good, but I wanted to see 
how it worked, how this restore worked. So I started taking it, a teaspoon before each meal, and the first thing I noticed was incredible mood elevation, feeling really happy. Then I started noticing that things got better. Digestion was better. Sleep was incredibly deep. Dreams were amazing. It was like my creativity was back in my subconscious. The most entertaining, deep, fascinating dreams. But apart from that, and possibly more important than that, a lot of little symptoms have started to disappear. Things that I didn't even identify until they were gone for several weeks. So I've had a string of steady improvements, but much better energy and much better happiness and much better attitude. So on some level, I believe Restore is creating in my body a much better regulation of cellular and subcellular work, let's call it. And that translates all the way up because all the way up the totem pole, it affects your mood, your psychological state, your emotional state, your creative state, your spirituality, your philosophical positions. And it's worth the money. The money seems expensive. It's $50 for a month or $70 for a two-month supply. But I say you've got to try it. So that's why I pull, put it on the Earth Minerals site. FlatEarthMinerals.com will bring you iodine, magnesium, and restore. And there's a three-pack you can get for just $5 shipping. So you can try it all. And people I know have, have been raving about it. And slowly, it's making a lot of people feel a lot better. And, and I am one of them. So this is the first uh, show that we've done where we're actually pushing some, not pushing, giving information on something that you can buy. And for the fear of this sounding like a commercial, um, I wanted this to come out because I personally use it and I want other people to use it. And I love the fact that you named the website Flat Earth Minerals. <laughs> That's my favorite part as well. Yeah, I mean, and it is a cool website. I mean, we our, our front page picture was done by David Dees. Yep. So I say Restore Iodine and Magnesium are too good not to share. That's why I want to share this stuff. It's not just to sell something. And this is how I stay alive, honestly. If I didn't make money selling the things I know about and sharing this information, going to such lengths to break this information down so that it's understandable by the average person, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do this. If I couldn't survive, I wouldn't be able to do what people are thanking me for doing. So I'm thanking you for keeping me going by buying and trying some of this stuff. So I just want to want to point out as we wrap this up that um these these uh, products you can get them anywhere you want or you can get them from the person that taught you about them for about the same price uh, it may be even better um, but Sophia has literally changed my life with all of the knowledge that she has given me and. I, I'm I'm a very happy person. I don't really have nothing to compare it to. Like maybe without the stuff, I'd be a miserable, uh, <laughs> crotchety person. But I'm I'm extremely happy, healthy, and um, I just want all the people in my life to use these things and enjoy health beyond what they've imagined. Yeah, and, and I, I think I want to try some of that restore. But tell everyone where they can where they can get the restore. FlatEarthMinerals.com has the three basics, magnesium, iodine, and restore. And you can get them all at once for $5 shipping and be done with it and then try it. You can go and look on the internet for this stuff. You won't find the same kind of iodine at that price. Nascent iodine is a lot more expensive than the $20 bottle I sell. Magnesium cream you can find, but you're not necessarily going to find the kind that we sell. And you're going to pay shipping three times. So I would say try it from flatearthminerals.com. It's a very simple way to buy all at once from one place. And then I'll share more things that I discover. That's what we want, right? Absolutely. I say we need to support each other. People that teach you about things, um, support them. You know, Just like you support your local bookstore rather than going to Amazon. Um, so you know, it's easy to click Amazon, one-click buying. Um, but it's not much more difficult to buy from Sophia. We have one-click buying. <laughs> there you yeah. go. 
Um, all right. The delay is back to haunt us here. So I'm going to say thank you for coming on, Sophia. Thank you for all that you do. And um, we're looking forward to talking to you again in the near future. I thank everyone in advance. I really urge you to go to flatearthminerals.com. You can check out my blog as well at Sophia with an F, sophiasmallstorm.com. And my podcast page is accessible from the blog. And um, I would like to just, again, thank David and Jay for this opportunity. We're not really pushing products. We are just trying to explain why everybody is dropping behind in the race to feeling even, even tolerable. We have to feel good. If you don't feel good and you're not organized on the cellular level, it's going to send the less, rest of your life into a tailspin. So you want to get better so that you can feel and act. And the law of attraction says you're going to draw things into your life that work for you, but you can't do that if you're not in a good space, a good emotional, spiritual, mental, biological space. So this is the easiest way to get there that I know of. Copy that. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us, Sophia. And we'd love to have you back on the show again in the future. And Dave, you got anything else to add before we ride off in the sunset? No, that is it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next show. Well, my dad felt a little bit sad for me when I mentioned that word gravity. He said, have a little independent thought. A question what you've just been taught. I mean... How the hell could a ball that spins make a force so strong that sucks everything in? Yet birds and insects fly unaffected. Gravity must be so selected. The Flat Earth Podcast.